OK, so it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, so as Jordana explained, I will talk about structured learning and deep learning. Um, oops, let's see. Let's turn this on. OK, uh, let me first start by um, acknowledging some partners. So I've had uh, the good fortune of working with um, several companies. And, and also, I'm, all, um, I'm about to become a member of the Vector Institute. Uh, I'm also a member of the Waterloo AI Institute. And then uh, some of the research that I do um, is mostly in machine learning. But uh, generally speaking, uh, it is applied into a bunch of applications. So I do some work with Ford on autonomous vehicles, as well as uh, ProNav and Scribandi. These are two natural language processing companies. Uh, there's also Focal Systems in computer vision and Huawei Technologies uh, for telecommunication networks. And then some of the work that I'm going to be presenting today, in fact, comes out of some of the discussions that I had with these partners. Uh, because as everyone knows, deep learning has become quite popular. But the, very often, the question that comes up is now, let's say I want to design a deep neural network. Well, what should be the architecture? So a lot of people were asking me, well, is there a way that we can automate the construction of, of a deep neural network. And then so I'll, I'll explain some of the work that we've done towards this. OK, so uh, more broadly, so my research group works on a number of things. Uh, so deep learning is one of them. And again, today I'll talk about automated structure learning. Uh, this will be in the context of a, a special class of, of deep neural networks known as some product networks. So I'll explain this in, in more details. Uh, but otherwise, I've also done a lot of work in the past on, on reinforcement learning. Uh, so today, I still continue to do some work in that sphere. This un includes constrained reinforcement learning, planning as inference, model-based deep reinforcement learning. And then in terms of applications, this includes autonomous vehicles. Uh, for natural language processing, I do some work on conversational agents and also automated language editing. Uh, so there's some nice um, uh, breakthroughs that are coming out in, in that sphere, and this is really exciting. And then I also do some work in theory. Uh, so we're looking at convex relaxations in the context of, of deep learning. So often um, the, um, the problems are, are, are in terms of optimization, but then they're difficult. Uh, so we can't find global optima. So how can we relax um, these uh, optimization problems? And also look at the characterization of uh, various local optima for mixture models. And, and finally, um, how can we show the consistency of various uh, Bayesian techniques? So this gives you a range of uh, some of the things that I work on. But today, I'll focus uh, only on automated structure learning. But afterwards, if anybody has got uh, any question about any of those other topics, I'm, I'm happy to, to get into those as well. OK, so here's the outline. I will first um, make some introductory comments about deep learning, specifically about architecture engineering. Then I'll uh, focus in on, on one specific class of, of deep neural networks that are known as some product networks. And then I'll explain how we can do structure learning in a batch way. And then after that, um, using online techniques. And then if you're interested, uh, here's one reference of some work that we published uh, last year at ICLR. And this is uh, regarding the online structure learning part. OK, so deep learning has become hugely popular. Um, it, it has led to major advances in, in lots of fields. Um, and then very often, um, I guess the lesson that we've learned from this is that we do not need to engineer features anymore. Uh, so we can often simply train directly on some raw data, and then the features will emerge uh, from the network. OK, so this is just a, um, um, a prototypical type of network where um, the, the hidden layers can be interpreted as um, features, although it's not always easy to come up with this interpretation. But in any case, um, a lot of the advances have come from the fact that uh, we do not need to engineer the features. But then the next question that comes is, what is the right architecture? OK, so 
um, then many of the advances today in deep learning come from people designing different architectures that have some properties that um, achieve what they want. So for instance, in computer vision, so ResNets have become quite popular. They've introduced uh, the notion of, of skip connection that allowed us to, to scale to really deep networks. Uh, if we're looking at, at sequence modeling, then for either machine translation or dialogue systems, you've got the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, uh, which has a specific architecture as well. And then very often, it's good to use uh, LSTM blocks inside to remember some of the uh, past information. Um, and then if you want to also focus on some parts of your input, then attention models are also very uh, effective. Now, all of these have in common that somebody spent a lot of time thinking through trying out different architectures and then show that they can be quite effective, right? And at some level, you could say that the name of the game in, in deep learning is often to come up with an effective architecture for, for your problem. Uh, but okay, let's say you've got a new problem and, and now uh, if you're not really um, into spending a lot of time designing an architecture and trying out all kinds of, of possible blocks and possible architectures, then what can you do, right? So you'd like to perhaps have a way of automating the construction of the structure and, and then so that's what I'll talk about today. Okay, so today we can say that for, for deep learning, uh, we already have uh, some good techniques for parallel learning. In fact, um, gradient descent is by far uh, the most um, used technique. I mean, it, it is uh, made available automatically in packages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on in terms of automatic differentiation. But now here's a question. What is the state of the art right now for structure learning? Can anybody name what is the technique that is the most commonly used at the moment if you want to uh, construct a structure. Does anybody have an idea? Yes, you got it, okay. <laughs> yeah, so okay, and, and I've given uh, this talk in several places and people don't always know, but yes, yeah, so it's graduate student descent, uh, which, which means that basically, yeah, you get your graduate students to essentially try different architectures and they're the ones essentially doing the construction, doing the automated structural learning, and it's a long process because, I mean, if it takes, let's say, a day or even a week to train a network, one architecture, right, then you need to to iterate over this and it's not something that uh, you, you can really scale. Um, so yeah, so we'd like to free graduate students. So in fact, at the University of Waterloo, you know, I believe strongly that we need to make sure our students are working on, on really interesting things. And then so I want to free them from that and then to look at, at, at more important problems. So then, yeah, we'll look at, at how we can do this automatically uh, without necessarily using students. Okay, so um, yeah, structural learning is uh, really challenging. Part of it is because designing the network, the structure is still considered an art. And, and then um, it, it also takes a lot of time to fine tune the architecture. Um, now there's been a lot of work already done on structural learning. So um, it's not something completely new. So if we go back in the early 2000s, uh, people had already explored evolutionary techniques. Um, then after this, there's been a lot of work on hyperparameter search. So here the idea is that you can think of uh, the architecture as being parameterized <coughs> um, with, uh, well, it, it can be specified through hyperparameters and therefore the notion of, of uh, constructing the structure boils down to the notion of specifying those hyperparameters. So then you can also use some search techniques for that. Uh, more recently, uh, reinforcement learning has been used as well to explore the space of structures. You can also use boosting style techniques and, and also Monte Carlo tree search techniques. And really here, this is just a partial list. There's, there's a lot of work that's coming uh, on a regular basis on, on this uh, topic. And in general, I mean, the benefits of, of these techniques is that you can often obtain better and smaller networks. Uh, so some of these uh, papers have shown that uh, you can often match the state of the art and yet obtain networks that, that are smaller. So in fact, I have a colleague at the University of Waterloo, Alex Wong, who uh, using evolutionary techniques can take uh, networks and essentially compress them by a factor of up to 200 and obtain the same accuracy. So, so, so yeah, so this is very nice. 
Um, but then in terms of the challenges, it's still time consuming because here, um, even though it's not the students doing the search, now it's your computer, right? And, and then so um, doing this when just evaluating one architecture might take hours, days, if not weeks, then uh, it, it, it is naturally uh, uh, something that's time consuming. In fact, some of the work uh, that has been published often will use lots of GPUs. So for instance, this work here on reinforcement learning um, used uh, more than 800 GPUs. So then it's also questionable to what extent uh, this is really scalable or to what extent you can really use this in, in practice. Okay, and then finally we can say that most of these as well will um, focus on, on a very specific family of networks. Uh, often the most popular family will be convolutional neural networks, so then they will essentially search in that space and, and optimize the architecture of convolutional neural networks. But then if you're not dealing with images or if you're working uh, with data uh, that for which convolutional neural networks might not be uh, adequate, right, then uh, this might not be uh, useful. Okay, um, so now let's talk about uh, another class of neural networks known as some product networks and then I'll explain for that class what we've done in terms of automatically learning the structure. So let me first start by defining what is a sum product network. Uh, so this was uh, an architecture, or at least a, a special type of, of neural network that was proposed by Poon and Domingos back in 2011. And the idea is that you have interior nodes that are only sums and products. Okay? Um, so in general, neural networks uh, are just computational graphs, so you can have any types of, of nodes. Uh, but here, let's just restrict ourselves for a moment to, to sums and products. The advantage of doing this is that now we're going to gain in terms of interpretability. Also, we can design some techniques that can exploit uh, this uh, very specific space. And then uh, I'll show you as well how we can learn the structure based on, on just these types of, of nodes. Okay, so beyond sums and products, uh, the other interesting thing is that in the leaves, I'm going to have some base distribution. This is going to become important in a moment. Uh, and what I mean by base distributions, these could be like uh, Gaussians, Bernoulli, Poisson, exponentials. Okay, so in this example, these are all Gaussians. So this would be, for instance, a Gaussian in the variable x1 with mean zero and, and variance one. Okay, so in general, um, these distributions at the bottom, you can just think of them as essentially taking some input and then producing an output that follows the function of that particular distribution, and then you propagate this up. Okay, so why is it interesting to look at some product networks, especially if we're going to restrict ourselves just to sums and products? Part of it is that, I'll explain in a moment, we can have some clear semantics for this class of networks. And it turns out that this class of networks is also a member of the family of probabilistic graphical models. So uh, there's been a lot of work in terms of Markov networks as well as uh, Bayesian networks. And then some product networks were in fact equivalent, so you can go back and forth between those. And, and then the main advantage is that they happen to be a tractable form of probabilistic graphical model. So I'll explain in a moment why, uh, but these are really the two views that we can have, and, and, and these are, are quite interesting in practice. Okay, so uh, for, uh, yeah, we, if we take a sum product network, um, we can think of it as representing a joint distribution over some features. And then in this little example, let's say that I've got two features, x1 and x2. And here I'm going to claim that this sum product network here can represent a joint distribution over those. And in particular, I'll show you how we can compute the probability uh, that x1 is equal to minus 0 0.3 and x2 is equal to 0 0.5. So these would be the inputs. Okay, so if I start with those as inputs, so what I'm going to do is simply feed those values uh, to the leaves, okay, and then propagate the values up. For the, so at the leaves, when I feed those values, I've got here some probability density functions. So what they're going to produce out is simply the probability density that, for instance, x2 is equal to 0.5 when the mean is 1 and the variance is 1. So like this would give us 0.35, and then we've got different values for each leaf. And then after this, we simply take a weighted uh, combination, then product, and then weighted combination. And we get uh, an, an answer of 5.40, which happens to be the numerator 
of, of this um, uh, distribution. So here, this probability is going to be proportional to 5.40. And in fact, here, just to be accurate, it's not really a probability. It's going to be a probability density. So the probability density is proportional to, to 5.40. So now, what I need to compute that's left is simply the, the denominator, so the normalization constant. And, and then I can obtain this through a second pass uh, through the network. So I'm going to restart. And this time, I'm going to start by essentially having one come out of every leaf. And here, the intuition is that if I want to get a normalization constant, what I really need to do is essentially integrate out all the variables in my network. And, and this will give me what is my normalization constant. If I integrate out every variable, well, these Gaussians, when I integrate them out, then because they're distributions, they integrate to 1. And so that's why I, I simply make them produce a 1. And then from that point, I simply propagate the values, and I get 100. So, so here, you see the probability density that x1 is equal to minus 0 0.3 and x2 is equal to 0 0.5 is simply 5.40 divided by 100. One conclusion of this is that I can do inference in linear time with respect to the size of the network. So in comparison to other types of probabilistic graphical models like Bayes nets and Markov nets, then here uh, we can guarantee tractability. So this is a, a nice thing. Um, now, with what I just explained, we can give some semantics. So essentially, the, the two numbers that were produced by every node, uh, when I divide them, it gives me the probability density of some variables uh, that are part of the inputs assigned to some values. And, and then, so in that sense, we can interpret everything that is being computed. So the problem with neural networks often is that you get a number, but then what is the unit? How do I interpret this? Right? So there's been a lot of work on, on how to interpret those numbers. In the context of some product networks, the interpretation is clear in the sense that they always compute or they always return uh, a probability, or otherwise a probability density. And then we know with respect to wh which uh, variable, these are going to be the variables that are in the subtree. So essentially here, I'm, this, uh, I'm defining the notion of a scope as being the set of variables in the uh, sub-SPN rooted at that node. And then to obtain this interpretation, in fact, I need to satisfy two conditions on the structure of the network. So the, the product nodes have to be what are known as decomposable, and the sum nodes have to be known, they have to be uh, complete or smooth. So what this means is that decomposable, I need the products to have, so if I take this product, it has to have children, so I've got two children here, that have disjoint scopes. And the reason for this is because if I interpret the children as computing a probability uh, over some variables in their scope. Now, if I want to make a joint distribution that includes those two children just by multiplying them, I'd like to interpret this as essentially a factor distribution over the union of, of the scope. And, and then so if the scope does not intersect, right, if they're disjoint, then it is a factor distribution, and I get this interpretation naturally. Um, and then completeness or smoothness. Uh, says that now for some nodes, we want children that have identical scopes. So here, if I take this sum node, it has two children. This one has in its scope x1 as well as x2. This one has the same thing, x1 and x2. So these are essentially two distributions in x1 and x2. And now I can interpret the sum node as really being a mixture of the children. And it's a mixture where uh, the weights are given by the numbers on the edges. Okay, so, so then as long as I have the same scope for both children, then the notion of a mixture makes sense. If not, then I, I have to do some more work. But um, in, in the case where I satisfy those conditions, then it, it just follows immediately. So that's the beauty here. All right, so now let's see how we can use some product networks. So, in comparison, for most neural networks, the way you use them is that you have your inputs at the bottom, then you propagate the values, you get your output, and then you can interpret the neural network as really just being a function from the inputs to the outputs. Now, in the case of some product networks, we also have the notion of inputs, but the inputs, really, we can divide them into what would be the, the real input that we're uh, feeding in, and then we can have outputs that are really what we're trying to, to get out of the network. And here, 
uh, we can use this to essentially formulate a conditional probability query. So, so in the case of, of some product networks, the outputs are not really at the top. Uh, so we can essentially take the leaves and partition them into inputs and outputs and then formulate a, a, a conditional uh, probability query like this. So here we would treat x1 as input. So that corresponds to those two leaves and then x2 as output. Uh, so then we have here a, a, question, a query about what's the probability of x2. So in other words, we want to know what, what would be the likely values that x2 could take. Um, so, so now you see, I can uh, decide what are the inputs and outputs at query time, which is something very useful. Uh, so as a concrete example, let's say that we want to do machine translation. So then uh, you could design a neural network to go, let's say, from English to Chinese. But then you'll need a second neural network to go from Chinese back to English. But then in the case of a sum product network, you could have, let's say, the English words here and then the Chinese characters here. And then you could simply, at runtime, decide that, OK, now I'm feeding in values only for English and then compute what's the, what's the output for Chinese or vice versa, uh, feed in only the characters for Chinese and compute what's the output for, for English. Okay, so, so then it's, um, it means that you can use the, the sum product network to answer uh, queries uh, that are different than what it was actually trained for and, and then so it, it generalizes more easily. Now to compute these conditional uh, queries, so we simply use the fact that it's the ratio of, a, mar uh, of a, a joint divided by a marginal. And then here we can do this in two passes. So for the, the joint, I've already shown you how to do it. So we get 5.40. And then for the marginal, which is the question that was just asked earlier. Uh, so here I'm going to do a second pass, where this time I set uh, x1 to minus 0 0.3 and then because I do not have x2 I integrate it out and therefore I'm just going to have the output of those to be 1 propagate the values and that gives me 18.9 okay okay so there's been lots of applications of some product networks um, so they include image completion activity recognition speech modeling uh, very recently also in mobile robotics uh, and here's another one for language modeling. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details of those applications, but the idea is that wherever you've got another type of neural network, you could in fact work with a sum product network as well. So all the applications of neural networks uh, are also applications of, of sum product networks. And then anywhere where you, you, you could have used instead a, a base net or a Markov net, then you can also consider uh, a sum product network. So the applications are vast and then it's just a matter of, of doing it. Okay, so now let me go into the details of how we can do structural learning for these types of network, and I'll start with uh, how to do it in a batch way. Okay, so here the problem is that we have some data, and then in fact, before we do structural learning, often the easiest task is just to do parameter estimation, and then in the context of some product networks, the parameters are all the weights on the edges, and also for the leaves, depending on what are the base distributions, we have some parameters, so here mean and variance of each Gaussian. So this is just a parameter estimation problem. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, you can use maximum likelihood. You can use Bayesian learning. There's a series of papers on this. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, naturally you can use gradient descent. So you can use your favorite package like PyTorch or, or TensorFlow and use automatic differentiation. But this turns out to be not uh, necessarily the best approach. So in fact, you can use more advanced techniques like EM, uh, also signal programming, and also some Bayesian techniques that are more uh, um, robust to overfitting and, and obtain often better results and faster. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into the details for this, but uh, that's, uh, there's, there's plenty of work on, on, on these techniques. Okay, now the structural learning problem is that again, we start with some data, but here we have nothing. Okay, so nobody has given us the structure. Now the algorithm is going to uh, come up with a structure on its own. So for this, there was a landmark paper by Gens and Domingos in 2013 that um, explained uh, a generic approach uh, that can um, automatically construct a reasonable structure. And I'll explain this and I'll explain how we've extended that afterwards. 
Okay, so the approach here, um, what you would do is you would essentially create some nodes by running a data clustering algorithm, and then you can produce some product nodes by running a variable partitioning technique. So we're going to start, let's say, by constructing a sum node. And here, if you recall, sum nodes corresponds to mixtures. And then mixtures often uh, can correspond to clusters in your data. So a natural thing to do is then to take your data and say, well, let's go the other way around. Let's run a clustering algorithm. And perhaps when we do the clustering, we obtain one cluster here, a second cluster here. And then what we do is we simply construct a corresponding sum node that will have two children, where the first child will be associated with this subset of the data, and then the second child with this subset of the data. And here you can run any clustering algorithm you like. So it can be k-means, it can be a mixture of Gaussians, it can be uh, an anything you like. Um, once you've done that, then you can uh, create, let's say, um, a product node. So we're going to continue and, and then recurse down. So we're going to take this subset of the data. And now creating a, a product node is the same as essentially factoring the distribution into two marginals. So that really means that we're looking at a way to partition the attributes into two subsets, or otherwise multiple subsets, that are independent from each other. So you can use variable partitioning techniques to do this and, and obtain, um, in this way, um, uh, a, a product node. OK, and then the algorithm would keep going. So we can further partition, let's say, the top part, and then create a sum node by a clustering, and, and so on. Any questions regarding this algorithm? OK, so yeah, so that should be fairly simple. Um, OK, so now with my group, what we've done is improve this um, structure uh, learning technique. And then the main thing that we've done is change the second step for product nodes. So instead of creating a single partition, we're going to create multiple partitions because the problem is that uh, most of the time, uh, the variables or the attributes are not completely independent. Okay, so, so usually everything tends to be correlated somewhat. And then therefore, partitioning uh, will, will break some of the correlations. And then it's actually better to have multiple of those partitions so that um, we can break some correlations in some places, but then recover them elsewhere. So the approach works as follows. So first step is the same. We do data clustering. Then the second step, now we're going to create multiple product nodes, where here uh, the idea is that um, one product node would correspond to one partitioning. And here we're going to break a correlation, but um, we kind of have no choice. Whenever we introduce a product node, that's what we have to do. But uh, then if we consider another product node where we break a different type of correlation, and a third one that breaks a different type of correlation, the idea is that the sum node at the top is really a, a mixture model that will capture those correlations that were broken uh, locally in those product nodes. So in this way, we do not make the same sort of drastic um, uh, uh, correlation breaking. Uh, so, so in this way, it's, it's just local, but, but then the sum node at the top will still capture the correlations. So that's, that's an, an important improvement. Um, and, and then otherwise, uh, the algorithm keeps going. So just to illustrate in more details, um, how do we do now the partitioning? So let's say that we've got a sum node with four attributes. Then uh, we can construct a correlation matrix based on the data. And, and then our first step um, is going to be to construct a maximum spanning tree, where we essentially extract from here what might be the most important correlations, so that um, then we, we have a graph. And then we can see after this, uh, if we break one correlation, then uh, what might be the, the smallest one we might want to break, and, and so on. So we can start by breaking this 1.6. Uh, so this will give us this product node, where we've got x1, x2 together, and x3 and x4 together. Then we can keep going. And let's say break the second uh, smallest correlation, get this, and then eventually break everything. OK, so this is a heuristic um, for essentially coming up with product nodes um, that break some correlations. But then again, the sum node at the top will still capture uh, the correlations that are being broken locally. Um, so yeah, so this is the approach that, that we designed. 
And then these are some of the results that we obtained. So in this case, um, we tested the approach on many discrete data sets, as well as several continuous data sets. Our technique is known as Prometheus, so it's, um, it's this right column here. And then uh, the algorithm that I explained from Poon and Domingos of 2013 is Learn SPN right here. And then we've got some other um, baselines that we compare to. And then in general here, whenever it's bolded, it means that we obtain better results. And then to see if those results are statistically significant, you can see that a down arrow means that this technique was worse than our technique in a statistically significant way, according to the Wilcoxon rank test. Um, so, so yeah, so we tested this on, on many data sets. And here what's interesting is that uh, those data sets, right, they're not images only. They're not NLP. In fact, they're just about anything. So we have uh, some data sets uh, that are like Netflix or so recommender systems. Um, we also have a movie data set. There's the WebKB. There's an NLP data, data set here, routers. Uh, so, so yeah, so there's a wide range of data sets. And then the idea is that here nobody architectured anything for the, the, the network itself, right? So this was all learned from data. And then we obtain some, some fairly good results. Um, we can also do this with continuous data. Uh, so here, I mean, the benchmarks are different simply because um, I guess, yeah, we can't use, um, well, usually they're either discrete or, or continuous. And then uh, the algorithms that we compare to are also different. But and again, we obtain uh, very good results. Yeah. OK, very good. So one. Um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, now also how we can do online structure learning. Uh, so the technique that I described is actually fairly computation intensive. That's why I only showed you accuracy results. I did not show you the time it takes. Uh, so that took a long time. But now, how can we do this quickly? And online structure learning, what we're going to do is essentially feed the data um, in a streaming fashion, and then have, the alg have an algorithm essentially process the data once, and then by the time it's done processing the data, it, it just returns a network. OK, so, so this will be fairly quick, and, and I'll show you the running times as well. OK, so to do this, we're going to need as well a parallel learning technique that is online. And then so we had to, in fact, design uh, something new for this. Uh, so the parallel learning technique that we used has two phases. So the first phase is that given a data point, we're going to determine a subtree that is most likely to produce that data point. So here I've got a data point minus 0 0.3, 0 0.5. And what I'm showing in red is the subtree that would be most likely of generating that point if we wanted to use the sum product network as a generative model. And here we, we can construct this simply by looking at each node. So if it's a sum node, we're going to ask among the two children which child had the highest density. So here, 5.83 is higher than 5.21. So it must be that this child was more likely to, to generate that data point. Whenever we get to a product node, we consider both children. And again, a sum node, so we, can, we pick the child that has the highest density. So it was this one. And then this way, we obtain a tree that is most likely to, to generate the data point. Now, given this tree, what we can do now is update the patterns in an online fashion, where what we're going to do is something very simple. We're going to maintain counts at every node in terms of how many data points would be associated with that node when we construct these most likely subtrees. So here, all of those red nodes, we're going to increase their count by one. And then I'm going to simply assign weights for each edge. That's going to be the ratio of the count of a child divided by the count of the parent. OK, so very simple. And, and this gives me the weights. And then for the leaves, if I have a number of data points that are associated with a leaf, then in that leaf, if I'm working with Gaussians, I need to know the mean and the covariance. So let's simply use uh, empirical estimates of the mean and, and the, the covariance matrix. And then I can update those in an online fashion. So, so this is a standard equation for doing the online update. OK, so, so this is a simple approach. And then you might say, well, OK, this sounds like you know, uh, a heuristic, a major hack. And, and then um, now what can we say about this approach? Why is it good? Um, so 
we can prove the following theorem, where we show that this powder update technique is in fact guaranteed to increase the likelihood of the last data point. And so this is in fact the same property that stochastic gradient descent has. So if you have a data point and you take a step in the direction of the gradient of that point, when you're doing stochastic gradient descent, then you're going to essentially increase the likelihood for that data point. And, and then so we can show the same thing here that what I just described has this property. Um, now, we're taking a step in some sense in, in a direction, updating the parameters, not the same as the gradient, so it's a different direction. And then another nice property is that here, there's no notion of gradient. So in fact, we do not suffer from any uh, gradient vanishing problem. So we simply update counts. And then those counts, we always update them by one. So, so then this is a nice property where it doesn't matter how deep the network is, right? So we can do the updates um, without any problems. OK, so this is a, a nice algorithm that, that, that works well and it's fairly simple. And now we can extend it to also do structure learning. And here the intuition is going to be that we're going to take the view that the network um, captures correlations in the data. And then whenever we detect a correlation in the data that is not already captured by the network, then let's simply update that structure. Let's change the structure to capture the correlation. So as a concrete example, let's say that here I have a product node and then I've got three subtrees. So I'm, I'm, I'm not representing the subtree, so I'm just putting here a box, but this would be an entire subtree. And let's say that this subtree has x1 and x2 in its scope. And the second one has x3, the third one has x4 and x5. Now the product node essentially imposes an independence um, uh, assumptions. So, it, so we're essentially saying that x1 and x2 must be independent of x3 and they must be independent of x4 and x5. But now in our data, if we detect that there's a correlation, let's say there's a correlation between x1 and x3 that exceeds some threshold, right? then it means that our network is not capturing this and we should change it. So we're going to update the network to capture this correlation. Now to do this, um, we can actually take two approaches. So our first option could be simply to construct a multivariate leaf where we're going to essentially merge those children together into one leaf. So here, if I work with Gaussians as leaves, then I can construct a multivariate Gaussians in x1, x2, and x3. And then the covariance matrix of that Gaussian will capture some of the correlations. And, and this should do the trick. The main problem with this approach is that now, if I have too many uh, variables here, then, then this multivariate Gaussian is going to be uh, quite large. In fact, its parameters are going to scale quadratically, um, and, and this is um, not ideal. And then also the covariance um, structure also uh, with a Gaussian means that it's a unimodal distribution, and often you want to be able to consider multimodal distributions, so, so this is not good enough. So we considered a second option, where we said, well, let's create a mixture inside the, um, the network. So we have just a product, and I can take a child tree, just copy it here. And then for child one and two, I'm going to copy them down here. But then let's embed them into a mixture with another child, where here I have x1, x2, and x3 that um, I'm going to assume are independent just to make things simple. So here, the idea is that this sum node, which is a, a mixture, can capture correlations, even though x1 and x3 are still in separate children um, in, in all cases. The fact that I've got a sum node here can capture correlations. And then this can also represent a multimodal distribution. So, so then that's a simple change that we can make whenever we detect a correlation. And then so then we, we created an algorithm that essentially detects correlations. And then if we just have a few variables, we use option one. And then if we have more, we use option two. And then we simply let the network grow as the data is being processed and correlations are being detected. Um, so yeah, so this is the algorithm, OSRO. And, and now here are some of the results. So first, we did a proof of concept where we started um, with some data that came from a mixture of four Gaussians. 
And then we wanted to see if the algorithm could in fact construct a structure that would recover precisely this mixture of four Gaussians. So here, for this data, it was in three dimensions, x1, x2, x3, where x1 and x2 are correlated, and then x3 is independent. So we simply started with a structure where x1, x2, and x3 are all independent. We fed some data, and then after 200 data points, the network had evolved to correspond to this structure. So what had happened is that it discovered that, yes, there's a correlation. It should introduce a mixture. And then, so it, then, it essentially constructed a mixture of two Gaussians, which are those two red circles. So this is not perfect yet, but it was just because we had 200 data points. If we continue with 500 data points, then the network keeps on detecting more correlations. It creates a larger mixture, and, and then it fits the data well. So, so yeah, so this was a proof of concept just to see if it works as intended on some synthetic data. And then after that, we applied this to real data. So we took various data sets. Um, some of them are speech recognition. Others are network data. There's power data. Um, and the others I don't remember. But in any case, uh, these are uh, data sets. You can see their size, number of variables. And these are, are not data sets for which we know what would be a good structure. And then they're fairly large to the point where we could not run uh, the batch learning algorithms. So when we ran our online structure learning technique, uh, this is the time that it took. So here, to process these data sets, it, it took on the order of uh, like from 12 seconds to 351 seconds. And then in terms of the accuracy, uh, so it was much better than just having a random structure, so that's, that was not difficult to beat. But then we also compared this to real NVP. That's another um, type of neural network uh, that essentially creates uh, some sort of uh, wrapper uh, to, to have a, a, a something that's generative that can also compute probabilities. And then so we compared to an offline and an online version of this, uh, this algorithm. And then these are the results that we obtained, so in general, uh, our approach was better. Um, and then now, when you do online learning, you can also stop early. So we wanted to see now if we run the algorithm till the end of the data, these are the results we get. But if we stop early, then we can obtain even smaller running times. And then uh, the accuracy in general will suffer, but just a little bit. And here, when we stop early, what happens is that we process 20% of the data where we do structure learning, and then the remaining 80% of the data, we simply do powder estimation. We do not change the structure of, of the model anymore. So then the size uh, will be smaller, uh, but then still we can obtain reasonable accuracy. So let's conclude. So here, uh, what I talked about today is a special class of neural networks known as some product networks. And then hopefully I've convinced you that they have some nice properties. In particular, uh, they have clear semantics. And then here I've described as well how we can do structure learning effectively. Um, so my research group has also worked on other types of extensions to some product networks. So like before it was asked, like what about temporal data? So we did some work on recurrent some product networks, and then we have some positive results as well in, in, in terms of comparing that to recurrent neural networks that use LSTM units. And then we've also extended this to decision making. So if you consider other types of operations beyond just sums and products, if you introduce max operators, you can interpret them as, as decisions. And this leads to what we call decision SPNs. And, and there, so um, for different types of problems, then um, uh, there's some uh, nice advantages as well. Um, so in the future, so we're currently working on, on a PyTorch library for some product networks. Um, so one of the limitations right now, so I've got a lot of people who ask me, okay, you convinced me that some product networks, uh, you know, are interesting. I want to try them. Now, where can I just, you know, download something and apply it to my favorite problem? Unfortunately, there's no package at the moment that makes that uh, something easy to try. And then, so that's why we're currently writing a library in PyTorch to, to do that. Um, Okay, and, and then in terms of applications, so with my research group, so we're, we, we're focusing on conversational agents, and this is where we're currently 
uh, looking into uh, ways of replacing, for instance, um, sequence to sequence models and, and other types of recurrent neural networks by a recurrent sum product network. Okay, so this is it, and thank you very much.